I am honored to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Mark Shen, a board certified cardiac electrophysiologist and cardiologist specializing in treating patients with heart rhythm disorders. He performs complex rhythm disorders. He performs complex cardiac ablations for various heart rhythm diseases such as atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia and implants, cardiac devices such as pacemakers and defibrillators and cardiac resynchronization therapy. He completed his electrophysiology fellowship at Northwestern University, Chicago, Illinois, so he's used to this cold, <laughs> and clinical cardiology fellowship and postdoctoral research fellowship at Indiana University. Prior to this, he received his internal medicine residency through the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Shen joined cardiovascular medicine in 2023 and holds position of director of cardiovascular research and education. He is passionate to bring the latest advanced technology and clinical trials here for patients in need. He oversees clinical trials involving pharmacological device and technological therapy for patients with heart rhythm disorders. He's authored dozens of peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters and won prestigious awards such as the Heart Rhythm Society Fellowship in Cardiac Pacing and Electrophysiology. Dr. Shen is board certified in electrophysiology, cardiovascular diseases, internal medicine, and echocardiography. He is licensed in both Iowa and Illinois. And besides the amazing work he does, Dr. Shen enjoys spending time with his wife and two boys. Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Shen. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I know you're here for atrial fibrillation, so I really want to uh, use the next 20 to 30 minutes or so to give you a really a good understanding about atrial fibrillation itself and also how we can offer as a practice in this hospital in particular um, about the management of atrial fibrillation. So I want to ask you a uh, first question. So I used to ask uh, anybody heard of atrial fibrillation, but I, I feel like the question I should ask is who haven't heard of the term AFib or atrial fibrillation? So everybody heard of this term, okay. So my next question is who know anybody in their friends or family or yourself got this disease called AFib or atrial fibrillation? So most of them you do. So you're here for a reason. My final question before my presentation, who know your friends or family member or yourself have gone to a medical professionals to seek medical management or consultation for a bit? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So I hope my next 20 to 30 minutes presentation, is this okay still? Or I could shout. Okay. So I hope my presentation is going to give you a little bit of idea. You know, since you all have experience, you may have some background knowledge. Your doctors may have told you or your friend or your family member, you kind of get some idea about atrial fibrillation. And really the disclaimer, although I like to do complex ablations and AFib, um, you know, I still think procedure aspect is just one part of the management. And I'll delve into this in more detail. I think a lot of things besides the procedure, a lot of things actually besides the healthcare professionals, a lot of things you can do uh, for AFib, this disease, which is getting more and more frequent. And this is really the background slide. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you ask the same crowd, have you heard of AFib? Have you known anybody with AFib or gone to a hospital or gone to a clinic for AFib? I don't think the percentage is that high. Actually, AFib among some older doctors, they still think this is a made up disease or you know, this is an over basically exaggerated phenomenon and 
they don't think AFib is that serious. You know, they think cardiology is basically a heart attack, heart failure. AFib is really just a, you know, something that people really don't feel it. You know, why do we care about AFib? But I'll tell you why. First, AFib is getting more and more common. And you can see here, when you reach just the Medicare age, the incidence is about 3%. And this may be underestimated. But when you reach 80 years old, more and more people live to their 80s and their 90s. The, in, the percentage of total population in this age with AFib is over 10%. Some estimate even say one in seven. So that means, let's say if you go to a group of people who are older, eight, you know, older than eight years old, you can almost guarantee some of them they have AFib themselves. All right. So this is very important. As people age over time, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is only going up. This is a one-way street. By some estimate. By 2050, 2050 is just 27 years away. You can expect almost 15.9 million people with atrial fibrillation in this country alone. And AFib is becoming more and more in developing world as well. This is not just in the developed world. So it is a worldwide public health burden. What is AFib? I, I think this crowd is pretty intelligent. You know, you have experience, but I think uh, it's sometimes you will see, at least I've seen people with AFib themselves. They even go through ablation, but they really cannot say what is AFib themselves. And I, I, I want to keep everybody on the same page. The heart is basically a piece of muscle. It's controlled by electricity. To put it very simply, there are top chambers, there are bottom chambers. Electrically speaking, the top chambers call the shot. So what the bottom chamber is doing is really to follow the top chamber. So the top chamber beats first and the bottom chamber follows. They're just follower. Normally, the top chamber beats faster when you exercise, beats slower when you're asleep. The bottom chamber follow it's a one-to-one -one fashion. The top chamber, we call it atrium or atria. The bottom chamber, we call it ventricles. Atrial fibrillation, by definition, the top chamber, the atrium, fibrillate. Fibrillate is kind of a term, sort of a misnomer, because macroscopically, it doesn't beat at all. It basically quiver. You know, it, it, it doesn't beat at all. So. The top chamber doesn't beat. The bottom chamber, the ventricles, they're so used to follow, following the top chambers. Now you don't beat at all. What do I do? I beat erratically. In medically, we call it irregularly irregular. So there's no rhythm. There's no basically pattern. It beats generally fast. And this is important. Generally fast sometimes slow, but generally fast. And because of that, it can create problem. The first problem is symptoms. So what you can feel with atrial fibrillation, and this is important. I would say a very common symptoms often ignored is fatigue. Fatigue, sleep more, take more naps, feel tired all day. It's a very nonspecific symptoms. AFib oftentimes presents as fatigue, but not all fatigue is atrial fibrillation. Otherwise, everybody's tired, everybody's AFib. No, not that way. But when you get to a certain age, remember that prevalence gets higher when you get older. You need to have a high index of suspicion you know, you may not feel your heart is racing. You may not feel anything else, but just being tired. So if your doctors or if you rule out other common reason for you to be tired, think about this disease because it's not that rare. It's very common. Short as a breath, another very common 
uh, symptoms, especially when you try to do something. Again, very non-specific. You can get shortness of breath with exercise with a lot of other reasons. You know, you don't even have to have a disease just by getting old. You can have that. Lightheaded or dizziness, it's common as well. Palpitation is probably the most specific reason, you know, uh, you know, symptom. My, it's a subjective feeling of their heartbeat faster. Um, it's, it's more specific, but it's not that 100%, right? So you can have your heart racing for a lot of other reasons as well. You may have chest pain, but importantly, a lot of people, they really don't feel anything. And this is really what drives a lot of problems, you know, for atrial fibrillation. It can be underplayed by your primary physician. It can be underplayed by yourself. It can be underplayed by even some cardiologists. You know, they said you don't feel anything. You know, your heart is in a good shape. You don't have to worry about this. And to make it more complex, you're not even in AFib all the time. Some people, they're in AFib perhaps 5% of time. So at a random checkup, you're maybe in normal rhythm. Your heart is in a good shape. You don't feel bad. All the more reason for you to say, I'm fine. I don't need to do anything. And this is really creating some issue. So let's say if a person has atrial fibrillation and I really don't feel bad or I don't feel anything at all, why should we care? as a patient, as a family member, as a friend, or as a physician or healthcare professional. The reason why we care is because of AFib can create, can create issues that is beyond AFib itself. The first and foremost is stroke. Am I blocking your way over there? Okay, I can try to sit over here. So, Stroke is probably the most important reason for us to think serious about AFib. And 20, 30 years ago, people don't really tie this link together. People don't think AFib and stroke has anything to do with each other. Not until 20 years ago or so, people started to think about, wow, in patients with atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke is 500% more. Five fold, okay. And we're not talking about a small stroke, self-limited stroke. We're talking about often debilitating or fatal stroke. And I'll tell you the reason. So stroke, five times more, often debilitating. This is probably the most important reason why as a physician, as a patient, as a friend or family, we should take AFib serious, even if you don't feel much. Congestive heart failure. With AFib, the heart typically beats faster. It's like you're driving a horse or, you know, you're, you're, you're making yourself work too hard. Our heart, if you work too hard, it can slow down. It can get bigger, get weaker. When your heart is not pumping as well, you start to build up your fluid backward to your lungs, to your legs, to your neck, to your GI system, to your all over your body. And congestive heart failure alone by itself carries a higher mortality as well. More recently, AFib has been linked to premature development of dementia, and this is serious. And this is thought to be due to not as debilitating stroke, but it's a small little clot that goes through the brain and they kind of make a person, you know, more demented. And obviously, AFib by itself increased risk of mortality, right? So this is really serious. We have to think about this uh, in a different way. So now get to the meat of the presentation. How we manage atrial fibrillation in 2023 and beyond, particularly in this hospital, what we can offer in our practice, what we can offer. Traditionally, we talk about three pillars of AFib management. This go back to, you know, when we we're in medical school, you know, 
we thought about these three pillars of AFID management, if you will. When you think about how to manage AFID, you will tell you about rate control. I'll delve this into more detail. Rhythm control and stroke prevention. But more recently, I think lifestyle changes, and this is what I think bring you here. You know, you want to be exposed to a healthy diet. This is important. Healthy way of thinking about living. Rehab, exercise, lifestyle modification, lifestyle changes is becoming more and more recognized. Not just among YouTube or, you know, some social media, but also in healthcare professionals. So when we go to our conference, medical, you know, conference, scientific conference, there is a separate session about lifestyle changes. We're not talking about all the latest technology alone. We're talking about lifestyle changes. What you can do yourself, this is what life change means. This is a complex slide, but basically you can do this in two fronts. Before the AFIT occurs, you can try to do something yourself to prevent the, the occurrence of AFIT. That's what we call it primary prevention. Once AFIT already developed, let's say if you already have AFIT, what I can do to minimize the burden of it. Remember, AFib is not 100%. You may not spend 100% of your time in AFib. AFib can come and go. Some people, they have AFib once every year. Some people, they have once every few days, and it can last for a few minutes, few hours, few days. What you can do to minimize the burden, that's important. Minimize the burden. By minimizing it, you minimize the chance of developing stroke. And that's another important concept. The higher the burden of AFib, the higher the chance of stroke, the higher the chance of heart failure. So simply minimizing the burden. You don't have to necessarily get rid of it. Minimize the burden, help a lot. I simplified this into five fronts that you can do yourself starting today. The first one, and this applies to primary prevention and secondary prevention, which means you don't necessarily need to have AFib. You think about this, you will minimize the chance of you developing AFib. <laughs> Alcohol consumption. So the traditional teaching is male one drink a day or two drinks a day, female one drink a day is good for your health. Or cardiac health. And that is true for the plumbing side of the heart. That is true for preventing a heart attack, preventing cholesterol buildup in your heart arteries. That is really not true for AFib. Actually, for AFib, any alcohol consumption increases the risk. So I don't like to take pleasure out of some people's life. If you never had AFib, or if you have AFib, but it doesn't really bother you too much, I say try to limit your alcohol consumption. But this is important. You have to understand the relationship between alcohol consumption and AFib. Some people, they really don't know. And this is important for you to realize. If a person tell me that, oh, I have this AFib, it's getting more severe, I don't want to take medication, or I don't want to opt my medication, I'm not thinking about doing anything, I would say, do you drink? Yeah, I drink a couple of beers a day. I would say, try to do that first. Okay, that is important. That's something that person can do that himself or herself. Because any alcohol consumption increases the risk of AFib. Second is weight loss or obesity. So this is another important concept. A lot of people, you know, I think most people here are in shape, but a lot of my patients are not in shape, and some people are frankly very obese. If you tell somebody who is 330 pounds, weight loss, they don't know what to do. Really, they don't know what to do because their ideal body weight may be 190 or 180. 
there it comes in population study. OK, so we're not talking about anything just based on nothing. We talk about anything based on scientific science, re, uh, scientific research. What is the target for weight loss? 10 percent, 10 percent of your weight, not your body weight, your weight. So let's say if somebody who is really obese, 330 pounds, I tell this patient, you need to lose 10 percent of 330 pounds. Your target is 300 pounds. Obviously, that's the beginning, but 300 pounds is way more achievable than 180 pounds for that person. And there is, is a Australian study demonstrated very nicely if a person, an obese person, lose 10% of their body weight you can reduce your AFib burden by 90%, 90%. That is probably better than any drug, probably similar or even better than some ablation procedure. All right, so 10%, that's the number I try to teach my patient. 10% is not hard, and we weigh the patient every time. Next time we come in, we can comment on their weight changes and, you know, diabetes. So good glycemic control, make your A1C less than 7%. It's very important because diabetes, believe it or not, change the architecture of your heart, specifically the top chamber. By changing how we control our blood sugar, our blood sugar concentration, help ameliorate that bad changes in our heart. Sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. This is... Very, very important as well. OK, so sleep apnea is more common than we think. A lot of my patients, they don't look like somebody with sleep apnea, but I get them screened anyway, and they're positive. And once they get on treatment, they said, I sleep better. And those patients, they didn't really think they sleep bad to begin with. So sleep apnea, you know, the traditional questionnaire is, do you feel refreshed after you get up? Do you fall asleep during the day? Um, do you snore overnight? Those kind of questions. And some people, you can look at a person and you can kind of tell they have sleep apnea. Some people, you have to have a high index of suspicion. Sleep apnea, people actually did a study. They actually monitor their breathing pattern and monitor their autonomic nervous system overnight. And believe it or not, every epidemic episode is accompanied by a surge of their sympathetic drive. Sympathetic is a fight or flight system. We're not supposed to happen when you're asleep. All these sympathetic surge translate into a surge of your blood pressure, transiently, yes, but all these surge of sympathetic tone or your blood pressure overnight make your heart not tolerable and you can develop atrial fibrillation that way. High blood pressure as well, hypertension. So maintain your blood pressure control. That is important. Um, make your top number of your blood pressure less than 140 if possible by any means, diet control, medications, etc. So these are five things you can do yourself to make your AFib go away, hopefully, or minimize the AFib burden, or make it don't come to bother you uh, at some time. Reduce your alcohol consumption, lose 10% of your body weight, good glycemic control, diabetes control, screen or treat your obstructive sleep apnea, and good blood pressure control. And I have to emphasize, this is something that is equally if not more important than what i'm trying to talk about next okay so the other three pillars of AFib management is probably you have to one way or another help by one of us healthcare professionals i choose stroke prevention to start because i think this is most important um what we can do to prevent a stroke and that has been 
done by years of study. The first thing we can do to minimize the risk of stroke is by taking pills. These are commonly known as blood thinners. So you take blood thinners to minimize the risk of stroke. Remember I talked about when a person has AFib, the risk of stroke goes up by five times. Let's say 75 years old man with a high blood pressure, history of smoke, a little bit touched by diabetes, pre-diabetes, there is a risk of stroke for this person. The stroke risk is not zero. However, if this same individual develop a thin, the risk goes up by five times, and that becomes very significant. How to minimize the risk of stroke by taking these blood thinners is one of them, one of the way, and it reduces the risk of stroke down to as if this person never had AFib, but it's not zero, okay? Because stroke comes from different kinds. You can come with a small little uh, stroke. It can be a big clot, that kind of stroke. It can be bleeding, that kind of stroke. So these blood thinners reduce that extra portion, that five times more <laughs> risk that bring by AFib, but not reduce it to zero, but it's still worth it. I mean, these are, proven to be safe and effective therapy for AFib management, for stroke prevention. When I say safe, it's not risk-free either. Blood thinners increase risk of bleeding. That's what blood thinner will do. We have older blood thinner. Some people joke about a rat poison because that is true. These are coumadin, warfarin. These are poisonous to even human, if you take in a very, very high dose. It is still useful or irreplaceable by uh, these newer agents I'm gonna talk about in certain situations. For example, if you're mechanical valves or if you have some certain degree of valve issues, um, but those are rare. By far the most majority of people with AFib they will be a candidate for these newer agents. Um, these newer agents are commonly prescribed as a first line now. It's actually a preferred agent for most healthcare individual, uh, healthcare professionals. And in some medications, you're probably going to be left with a prescript when you leave the hospital with a new AFib episode or in the clinic. These are unfortunately slightly more expensive or very expensive, depending on what kind of insurance you have. They are very convenient to take compared to the Warfarin. They are safer in terms of risk of bleeding in general, especially the bleeding into the head. Those are the worst outcome you can have by taking a blood thinner. And comparatively speaking, by and large, they're more effective in preventing stroke as well. So to summarize, these newer agents are safer, more effective, and more expensive. Hopefully in the next few years, some of them start to become generic and is more affordable. And they all have a reversal agent as well. So it's not you know, something people worry about in the beginning, but um, so if you're gonna see maybe yourself or your friends or family member being put on one of these newer agents more and more. Some people, unfortunately, they don't tolerate blood thinner because they have bleeding. And what do we do? What we can offer in those patients? In current era, FDA approved two devices. This is the first one they approved. It's something we call a watchman. So this is a hard structuring. Uh, I just put a cartoon over here. You can see this is a pouch. It's really like a pocket of your coat. This pouch, we call it left atrial appendage. And you can just refer it as pouch. People will understand. This pouch is responsible for over 90% of clot that forms in a fit. Remember we talk about the heart doesn't beat at all in quivers. 
our blood needs to flow. Otherwise, it's one o'clock. When you draw your blood and sit outside, don't shake it, just leave outside. A few minutes, it will form clump. That's what happened. This pouch, blood flow in and out, especially in AFib, the blood doesn't flow very well. It tried to become very static inside this pouch and it can form clot. So by taking a blood thinner, Coumadin, Eliquis, Zoralto, and thin the blood to a certain level. So the blood, even if it doesn't move much, it doesn't form clot. But taking a blood thinner, it can be hurtful for some people with GI bleeding, for example, you know, bladder bleeding, nose bleed, those kind of things. So Watchman is one of those mechanical devices. Basically, it's a cooter or a, a, a plug. It goes through the groin, and we place this kind of a umbrella device to block the blood flow in and out of this pouch. And there's a protocol for that. Uh, you have to make sure you're suitable for this. You have to make sure this occluder sits in a nice spot and stays uh, that way. But if all goes well, and the percentage of success is over 99%. It's, it's a very mature uh, procedure. The blood will stop communicating, and that person can stop blood thinner either right away or preferably after 45 days. And there's a protocol for that. Watchman is the first one that's approved. And more recently, there is something we call amulet. It's a similar device, you know, going through the groin. Um, it's it's a different kind of design and maybe suitable for somebody with unfavorable anatomy for launching. And these two are both available here. So switching gear to talk about rate control. So rate control, by definition, we control the rate. More commonly, we slow down the rate. Because remember, AFib, the heart rate is generally faster. And this is important because some people, their symptoms of AFib actually is a consequence of really fast rate. So by slowing it down, people will feel better. And most of these can be achieved by medication. And these are commonly overlapping with blood pressure drugs. So you have to be careful about dropping their blood pressure too much by taking these drugs in combination with your blood pressure drug. Metropolol is a commonly prescribed drug uh, for this reason. Atanolol, cortisone or teotiazin, very commonly prescribed. Rocamil and digoxin is not as common, but these are very common. We call them rate control agent, rate control agent. Very important. To understand, you take this medication, you really don't address AFib itself. The AFib still come and still go. You really have no control. Same thing as the blood thinner. A lot of my patients, they don't understand why I'm taking eloquence. I still have AFib because that doesn't control their AFib. They only minimize the risk of stroke. Same thing with these medications. You will still have AFib come and go, but you don't feel as much because your heart rate is much better control. Some patients of mine, they ask about pacemaker and, and you know, I, I decided to add this in the management because uh, this is important. The question usually goes, I heard about pacemaker for AFib. Can I get one of those? because I don't want to take medication. I feel like ablation is a little bit too invasive. Can I get a pacemaker? And oftentimes these patients, they may have known someone live with a pacemaker and then live for another 30 years. So they feel like this is a very safe option. So the answer is yes, pacemaker is one of the management options for AFib, especially in patients who have failed other options or if the person has very slow heart rate to begin with, and that is important. Why 
pacemaker is not a preferred option, at least first line option, is because this option has serious drawback. And I'll tell you why. First, pacemaker, you've probably heard about this and seen one of those. The traditional pacemaker, we make a pocket in the left chest usually and then put a couple of leads or wires to your heart and you can kind of regulate your heart. In this hospital, we also offer something we call leadless pacemaker. And there are used to be just one vendor, there are two vendors now. Um, these are kind of a, like a small little bullet. Instead of making a pocket in the left chest or right chest or wires in your bloodstream, we go through the groin and then put in this little, uh, little pacemaker, like a bullet, and kind of secure it in the heart. And uh, both will really do similar things and kind of regulate your heart. Only a pacemaker is not helpful. You have to somehow disconnect the electricity from the top chambers to the bottom chamber. That will make pacemaker work. And because of that, this person's heartbeat is dependent on the pacemaker. Okay. And that is really why we don't think this is a very good option, at least the first line, because you're committed, this person, to depending on an artificial device, which may fail over time. However, this may be an excellent option for some people. There are some patients, they try everything or if their heart rate is very slow, they need a pacemaker anyways. That is a beautiful option for this individual. So it is not right or wrong. It's just a different option and a different steps of management. But I think, med, you know, to summarize, either taking pills or pacemaker, either is a traditional pacemaker or a leadless pacemaker, played a big role in AFib management. Now get to the fourth pillar. That's a rhythm control. That's really what super specialists or heart failure, uh, heart rhythm specialists like us kind of, uh, you know, our roles in this rhythm control. So we talk about lifestyle changes. You can kind of do rhythm control by that. You know, you can minimize the burden by doing that. But that required determination, will, and time, and efforts, and patience, a lot of things. People sometimes really don't have luxury to wait for that. We talk about stroke prevention. We talk about rate control. That, those things, they don't address AFib itself. Rhythm control is what address AFib itself. It minimizes the chance of AFib recurrence or prevent future occurrence of atrial fibrillation. What we can do. Again, the first one is pill. You may be put on this, we call it a heavy duty medication. Right? These are heavy duty medication. They not only slow down the rate in general, but also prevent AFib from coming. These are oftentimes reserved to cardiologists or you know, usually one of us to manage because they can be very challenged challenging to monitor or even start. Some of these medications, you have to be admitted to the hospital to start or spend three nights in the hospital. You know, maybe some of you may have that kind of experience or heard of that kind of experience. When we explain this to the patient in the outpatient clinic, it's hard for them to understand why do I need to take a drug in the hospital? And believe me, I don't want to do that, but that is the law. The FDA required us to do that. And the reason is all these medications are double edged short. It can treat heart rhythm disorders. It can cause heart rhythm disorders if you don't manage them well. So we are treating atrial fibrillation, but it can cause dangerous arrhythmias, especially the bottom chamber. People can die from those medications. That's why some of these medications, you have to monitor them very closely. Some of these medications, you have to monitor them closely for side effects. It can hurt your thyroid organ, it can hurt your lung, you can hurt your liver. So we have protocols in outpatient settings to monitor the toxicities, you know, periodically 
just to make sure we can catch them early to prevent irreversible complications from these medications. So, ablation. Who have not heard of a term ablation before? Ablation. Everybody heard of ablation? So, ablation is a is a uh, alternative option or uh, synergist, synergistic option for pills to control atrial fibrillation. Ablation is a misnomer by, by standard. Yes, you're ablating some tissues of the heart. So literally you're correct, but you know, when you try to ab explain ablation to patient, people become a little bit suspicious because ablating is a destructive process. And, you know, sometimes I joke about, you know, with my farming colleague, you tell the patient you have abnormal stress deaths, go get a cat. I put a stent in. People will say, yes, yeah, I fully understand. You know, stent, cat, that's easy for them to understand. You have a clog and you open it, you, you, you know, you put a stent, you keep it open. When you talk about ablation, you're, think, you're talking about removing some part of my heart to fix something. And, and that is something for some patients, they will feel like, you know, very, very suspicious. I like to call different term. You know, isolation is probably closer to the fact, but it's kind of hard for people to understand. Sometimes I just call it electrical correction or a fix. You know, people like correction or fix. It's more positive than negative. Just like a stent is more positive than negative. Ablation sounds negative. These Three terms are same thing to describe same phenomenon. So what is ablation, by the way? What we're trying to do anything. Uh, for the sake of presentation, I just still use ablation, but although I really don't like the term. Remember this diagram? Your top chamber quivers. And the reason why it quivers is because of this little yellow electricity it's kind of rapid fire, so rapid that it becomes, you know, it's like you try to make a fist 400 times per second. You're, you're not able to do that. You basically keep your hands open. The reason why it continues to fibrillate or it comes and goes and all that is because there are triggers, there are bad influence from really outside of the heart. Outside of the heart. If you will, these are people coming from out of town, just like me, coming out of town. And if they're not nice, you can influence this neighborhood. So your heart is like a homeland. It's like a neighborhood. People fly in from the airport elsewhere. You know, you can treat them like a terrorist. So you do this, you know, checkpoint. Basically, you have to verify their intention, why they're here, you know, are you a good citizen, your home country, et cetera. In people with atrial fibrillation, more than 90% of humans' AFib are caused by a structure really outside the heart. Those are blood vessels, actually. Those bad electricity, if you will, they travel along those blood vessels. So really, what we're trying to do in the ablation, isolation, electrical fix, or correction is trying to place roadblocks. Bad guys coming in, bad electricity coming in. What we're trying to do is to place roadblocks. To be more precise, we do overlapping roadblocks to ensure safety, ensure the durability of this, you know, this line. And this is this is important. In order to create these roadblocks, we have to ablate certain part of tissue. And this tissue, hopefully, you know, they're not really important because, you know, we really don't feel the difference why we need that kind of tissue to connect these two structures. Um, so what we can do to create these roadblocks 
Right now, there are two major ways. One on the right, we call it radio frequency. So radio frequency is a form we heat up the tissue to a certain degree, the tissue will die, create a scar. So we basically create an overlapping lesion. And these are commonly performed under general anesthesia. The catheter will go through your groin area. And then technically these are minimally invasive, right? So when I talk to patients, I said these are minimally invasive. You don't have a scar in your chest. You don't really have to stay in the hospital. You don't have to stay in the hospital for, you know, more than enough overnight. Some of my patients, they go on the same day. But the idea of the ablation is to create these overlapping roadblocks to prevent these bad electricity coming in. On the left, these are, we call it cryo balloon ablation. Cryo balloon is a different way of destructing the tissue, if you will. By lowering the temperature to a certain degree, the tissue will die as well. It combined with the basically a balloon technology. So think about if you're sticking a, your finger, wet finger on a refrigerator or a freezer, you get stuck on the wall. And that's what happened, this balloon, when you get to a certain degree, it was stuck on the wall and create a circumferential roadblock. So theoretically, it is more durable, seamless lesion. Uh, it can be more efficient. But I think uh, they actually compare these two studies in a very catchy name called fire and ice trial. And they demonstrated that in experienced hands, these two options are comparable, similar, both safe and outcome are similar. So um, in this hospital, we have both technology and then these are really operator dependent. Um, I think you're in good hands either way. These are two different ways of doing the things to achieve the same results, to block those bad electricity from coming to affect your heart. So these are my final slides. Um, so to the bottom line, because people have tried to compare taking medications, those heavy duty medications and ablations, the bottom line is that ablation is more effective, okay? Um, if you want to put it in numbers, the best medication we have is probably 60% success, whereas the ablation is 80%. And some people will say 70%. And a lot of people, they read about this number, and uh, actually some physician, they think about this number, they will say, I really don't want to try something that is only 70%, or 100%, um, or close to 100%. And actually, the reason why we call it 70% are due to the study design. And these are scientific studies. 70% success means 30% failure. What are 30% failure is within a year after the ablation, the person has 30 seconds or more episodes of atrial fibrillation. Okay. So, Hypothetically speaking, if a person has AFib that lasts for four hours every other week, after the ablation, you have two minutes episode in six months. That person will be considered as a failure. However, for that particular person, it feels like great. Um, so in more recently, people actually putting one of those recorder, loop recorder under the skin and those can 24-7 monitor a person's heart rhythm. It showed before and after the ablation, the AFib burden, all right? Burden is a simple math. The amount of time you spend in AFib over time was reduced by 99%, okay? So that is a very powerful study. Yes, we advocate minimizing the burden, and that is a very important concept to try to take away today. Yes, we all seek to cure, right? There's something we can cure in medicine. But more importantly, we try to manage it. AFib is a, it, it's a beast to contain. It's probably not something you can cure. But yes, 
just by minimizing the burn, you minimize the risk of the dreadful complications, you know, heart failure, stroke, and death. So after ablation in our clinic, every physician, they probably have a different schedule, but this or we call it the AFib school. If they don't have other significant medical issues, these are something that we kind of like to follow. So in a month, we do a growing check and do an EKG, and in three, six, 12 months, we kind of do a, uh, a more detailed exam. And we do a one-week ambulatory monitor just to make sure this person do not have, does not have recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Interestingly, some patients, they feel their AFib before, and oftentimes really bad. After ablation, they don't feel anything at all. And sometimes these patients, they don't feel their AFib anymore. Um, but the risk of stroke remains. And, you know, so that's why we still, even after 12 months, we still try to see them, you know, every year just to make sure they don't have any other symptoms, you know, and also focus on the secondary prevention of their lifestyle changes. So I think between Union Point Trinity in this hospital and then cardiovascular medicine, uh, we can offer um, AFib management through, you know, state of the art cath lab. I toured it during my interview. It is pretty good. Um, everything is state of the art. We do pacemakers, as we discussed, ablations over there, the watchmen over there. And also, this is very important. The cardiac rehab is lifestyle changes, exercise. I didn't put it into today's slide, but there is a, you can Google it. That's a real study. Yoga AF trial. Okay. So believe it or not, mood, yoga, sleeping deprivation, these all play a big role in AFib. AFib, in my opinion, is not a disease. It's an epiphenomenon of something bigger. It's like aging process in your heart. You can get cataract, can get low back pain, you get AFib. Um, Unfortunately, AFib is not just AFib. We really care about AFib because of stroke, because of congestive heart failure, because of dementia, because of increased mortality. And also, these are you know our newer outpatient uh, facility. We kind of monitor them AFib over there. So I think I spend uh, probably a little bit over time. I try to speak a little bit slower and. I apologize if this is something that is too easy for some of you, but I think uh, uh, I, 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 I was surprised to see some of my patients, they have ablation elsewhere and they really don't understand their aphid. Um, so I try to take this opportunity and maybe you can ask any questions. Okay. Where does or does as aspirin fit in with this? Okay, excellent question, excellent question. So I get, ask that question a lot. Why do I need to take Eliquis if I'm taking aspirin? Is that, isn't that a blood thinner? More commonly, Plavix, okay, Plavix or aspirin in general. So there is actually a study done to answer that question. And those are, uh, those are, the study is very old, but the conclusion is aspirin alone does not reduce risk of stroke in AFib. It only increases risk of bleeding. Aspirin is not as benign as we think. Okay, aspirin is probably more problematic than we think, particularly in patients with heavy ulcer disease. It increases risk of GI bleeding by a lot. Um, yes, if a person has indication for aspirin. I have a stent in my heart. I have severe blockage. I have a stroke before from the blockage in my neck artery. Aspirin is indicated because you train the benefits and risk in that kind of scenario. But if you want to take aspirin alone for AFib, that is proven to be harmful. If, if a person, there are two scenarios here. If a person is taking aspirin for Oh yeah, my primary care physician told me that might be good for me. 
Now, this patient, people may live. I try to stop their aspirin. I put them on a real blood thinner. That's what I call it, real blood thinner. It can be a Sorato, Eloquist, or Coumadin, or Pradexa. I stop their aspirin to minimize the risk of bleeding. Uh, the reason is there's no indication for aspirin. And believe it or not, people actually compare aspirin and Eloquist for a fixed band. That is one of the newer ones, and then follow them. The risk of bleeding is higher a little bit in aspirin. So these are, when we talk about the newer blood thinners, these are very good in terms of safety. The second front I want to answer about aspirin is, remember we talk about those occluder, watchman, and ambulance? Those are designed for patients who don't qualify for long-term blood thinners, right? So they may have some rever irreversible GI bleeding, nose bleeding on let's say Toronto, Eloquist, or Coumadin. So after a in-depth discussion with your physician, and sometimes require two doctors to approve that, um, you decide to go for Watchmen. After Watchmen, ideally you should keep them on the blood thinner for at least 45 days. And there is a protocol for that. Do a transesophageal echocardiogram in 45 days, six weeks, make sure the device is sitting well and well sealed. And then this person should be on aspirin and Plavix for six months and eventually aspirin alone. So aspirin in that scenario is not treating or preventing AFib because there's a watchman or ambulance in place is probably trying to minimize some risk of small little clot on top of the device and, you know, but that's how they run the study. So I oftentimes tell them, to answer your question, aspirin alone is not effective. And, you know, in certain scenario, aspirin might be helpful. And you know, have to look at a big picture. You know, people won't just have AFib. They have other things. Yes, go ahead. A follow up to yes. this question. How is Plavix yes. different from Sorelto and the others? Sure. So people lump it together as a blood thinner. The mechanisms of these medications are very different. Aspirin, Plavix, or if you're on some other things, we call it, you know, for Linta or Ambien, these four medications, we call it antiplatelet agents. Okay. These are medications for your heart, mainly in the stents, you know, your small little artery in the, in the heart. Sometimes it can be useful for the neck artery. They really don't play a role in this kind of clot. Okay. These are clot, how body forms clot is very different then how body form a small little blockage in the artery. That's why we don't use Plavix itself to treat a DVT, for example. We use, believe it or not, the same drugs for DVT because DVT and the clot in the heart, they're comparable. Uh, the dose may be different, but they're comparable. So if a person has a, and that goes back to, that's, that's a very good question because some people, they may have a fresh stent. They need to be on aspirin and Plavix, and all of a sudden, they develop AFib. We try to minimize something we call a triple therapy. Some people, they're on aspirin, Plavix, and Eloquist. Those are three medications. They work with different front. We try to minimize that, and there's a way, you know, and oftentimes, we, we require some collaborative discussion among person, family, you know, the plumber and the electrician. We kind of come together with a conclusion. Um, but there is a way to try to minimize while not sacrificing the beneficial effects of each medication. But the way I think Plavix is a super aspirin. And whereas these blood thinners are totally different animal, they're different. But yes, all together, they increase the risk of bleeding. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Thank you. Robert. I want to okay. respect your time. And oh, okay. you have given us a lot of great information sure. on atrial fibrillation. So please help me thank Dr. Shen. Okay.